So what do we mean by being bilingual or multilingual? Some people would say you are bilingual if you learned two languages from birth um, and, that you, uh, and if you master these uh, two languages equally well. Then you are bilingual. Studies, however, have shown that this is not quite correct and that in most um, uh, cases of bilinguals, the notion of a completely balanced bilingual um, is a myth. The experiments that we do show that even people who appear to be very proficient um, in their two languages, if you do the kinds of experiments that we do, you can always, almost always, discover that one language is a stronger language and the other is a weaker language. Um, and also, this is also true in early bilinguals. There may, may be multiple reasons for this, different conditions for learning or differences in the use of these two languages. So we would define bilingualism or multilingualism not narrowly, but broadly, including people who are more or less proficient in um, more than one language, right? In this sense, multilingualism is the norm and monolingual monolingualism the exception. What you find in some parts of uh, Great Britain or in uh, some um, central parts of the United States or also in uh, amongst the especially the older population in Germany that people are basically monolingual is across the world an exception. It's, it's not the norm. It's instead more, more typical for uh, people to grow up and live with multiple languages and learn them at different ages throughout their lives. Another myth um, we can safely dismiss is the idea that to grow up with two languages might overwhelm children or, um, might, or that they may mix in uncontrolled ways these languages and that they may find it difficult to distinguish them. Lots of studies have shown that if the conditions are right, um, children can easily learn two or more languages um, at the same time at native-like level, regardless of their intelligence. If you learn a foreign language at a later age, however, as an adult, for example, this is different. Here, you don't get this, this uh, auto automatic um, uh, learning of language that you get in childhood. Um, it's true that um, successful foreign language learning does not depend on intelligence either, but the acquisition of and use of second languages for adults follows different patterns. So let's think about this uh, difference between native and non-native acquisition of language a little bit more. Here is my take on that. So what's special about native language acquisition? Well, normally learning, a general learning, means adding new knowledge to existing knowledge. Say you're studying linguistics, you know, you learn something that you add to your knowledge that you had before you studied linguistics. Um, but the acquisition of language in childhood is something radically different from general learning. Take, for example, <clears throat> uh, Chinese or Japanese Infants, when they are born, they can distinguish the phonemes L and R, right? Before they learn Chinese and Japanese. Once they have learned Chinese and Japanese, they have lost this ability. Their parents cannot distinguish L and R, right? This is these famous uh, experiments where people monitored the sucking rates on a, you know, um, in, in infants. And so, in other words, the infant's brain, that is, those parts of the brain that represent the knowledge of language, are different from the adult's brain after the acquisition of a particular language. So you could say that before the acquisition of a particular language, say Ch Chinese or Japanese, the learning device the child has is not pre-wired to a particular language. It's open to any language. Um, and um, it has a set of options uh, to choose from uh, and then uh, easily learns and, and uh, selects a particular language. After the acquisition of a, of a particular language, you have lost something. You have lost these universal, the, 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 these universal options. You've lost your openness, so to speak, right? 
Um, and um, the, your language system, your language learning device, is fixed to a specific language. So learning your language as a child means loss of options that you had when you were born. This is very different from general learning. So considering how easily children learn language and how laborious it may be for adults, one may think the sooner the better. The sooner you start with bilingual education, the better the result. This is also a myth I would like to show to you. Um, our, study, our studies show that there is some, some kind of uh, sensitive period um, that goes uh, at least until the age of six or seven, maybe further, in which children um, can learn two or more languages as fully-fledged native languages. M most of bilingualism research is on cat and mouse and dog, on simple words, on lexical knowledge, on vocabulary, right? And we wanted to invest, to add to this um, with studies on grammar, on syntax and morphology. We test um, we investigate different groups of uh, multilingualism, uh, multilinguals, in comparison to uh, people who are largely monolingual or native speakers of a language. We look at early uh, multilinguals, both school-aged children um, at different age levels and at also at different ages of acquisition, um, and um, late multilinguals uh, who acquired um, uh, one or more um, non-native languages after childhood from different language backgrounds, different combinations of languages and also at different proficiency levels and multilingual children and adults who were diagnosed with uh, language impairments. And uh, this, is, this, is, um, this is what you need in order to um, achieve these aims. You need a laboratory that has um, that consists of at least these four components. So a reaction time uh, that allows you to do reaction time experiments and you can do this, these experiments, with any laptop computer. So you do, these are experiments that do not require a lot of technical facilities. We are also uh, using eye tracking um, um, te technology, so uh, eye, ta eye tracking during reading uh, so this can only be done with people who can read and write, <clears throat> uh, where the eyes, eye movements are monitored during comprehension of sentences or complex words. Um, and the sec and we, we have a second eye movement um, laboratory that's called Visual World Eye Tracking Laboratory. So this is a facility where that can be used with people. Um, this is basically eye tracking during listening. This can be used for people who cannot read and write, like children, for example. So children listen to speech and we, monitor, we show them pictures and we monitor the movements of the eyes during their listening. And this, uh, the fourth um, technique is EEGs, so electri, electro um, encephalogram, which records um, the uh, EEG during language uh, comprehension. And all these, techno all these techniques are necessary because language processing takes place on the, in, at the millisecond level. We are, not, we are not only interested at what comes out of the mouth, at the product. We are interested at the processes that go on during the comprehension or production of something. Right? And you will see an illustration of discrepancies between what people produce or what people give you as an output and what goes on in their mind in between. That's why we need to, um, we need these laboratories.